What is Vanuatu's new clean energy goal? And how much profit did Saudi Armaco make last quarter? Welcome to the Climate Recap from the Beckisphere Climate Corner, your go-to place for international and U.S.-based climate news. I'm Becky Hogue, a science writer. Today is Tuesday, August 16th. Let's jump right into the news you need to start your day. Let's start with an extreme weather event. The wildfire in northeastern Zaragoza province of Spain began burning out of control on Sunday and has forced the evacuation of 1,500 people from eight villages. Spain is in the worst drought it's seen in 1,200 years, making it particularly susceptible to wildfires. It has also been on and off heat waves. The wind on Sunday was blowing at 37 miles per hour or 60 kilometers and it burned about 20,000 acres or 8,000 hectares in less than a 24-hour period. Time for some climate studies. A study by the nonprofit First Street Foundation determined that an extreme heat belt is forming from eastern Texas up to southern Wisconsin, fully encompassing Louisiana, Arkansas, Missouri, Illinois, and Indiana. In this space, the heat index could reach at least 125 degrees Fahrenheit or 51.7 degrees Celsius at least one day a year in 2053. Some counties are already there, like Des Moines County, Iowa, and Union County, Arkansas, but most aren't. Parts of Southern California, Arizona, and New Mexico, as well as parts of Georgia, Florida, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Virginia are expected to see those high indexes by 2053 too. Overall, the number of people possibly exposed to at least 125 degree Fahrenheit days one day a year will increase by 13 fold over the next 30 years, from 8 million people to 107 million. First Tree has made similar risk analyses for flooding and wildfires, and if you live in the U.S., I recommend putting your zip code in to see how your home is or will be impacted by extreme weather events. Speaking of which, the U.S. set a new record in July for overnight warmth, according to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA. The lower 48 states saw nighttime averages of 63.6 degrees Fahrenheit or 17.6 degrees Celsius, which is a few hundredths of a degree above the previous record made in 2011. That nighttime temperature not only beat the record for the month of July, but also for any month of the year. Texas saw an average nighttime temperature of over 10 degrees Fahrenheit more than that average. Warmer nights lead to worse and shorter sleep, leading to less productive days. Hot nights disproportionately impact older people and poor areas, which usually have less access to air conditioning. It also disproportionately impacts homeless people. A new study called Arc Storm 2.0, led by the U.S. Geological Survey, determined that climate change has already doubled California's risk of a catastrophic mega flood, and the likelihood of this event increases by 683 percent by 2060 in high emissions scenarios. This extreme weather event is known as the other big one, with the first big one referring to a major earthquake we've been expecting for decades. Climate change is making flooding more likely due to increased wildfires and drought, killing vegetation that would otherwise absorb water into the soil. Destabilizing the ground increases the likelihood of flash flooding and landslides, as we've already seen in four 1 in 1,000 year flooding events in the U.S. this year. Meanwhile, climate change is increasing how extreme these rainfall events are too. Let's look at some climate victories. The small island nation, Vanuatu, launched an ambitious climate plan that commits the country's energy sector to reach 100% clean energy by 2030. To be clear, Vanuatu is already a carbon-negative country, meaning it stores more carbon than it produces. It's also one of the most vulnerable countries to climate change in the world, mainly due to sea level rise. Despite this, Vanuatu has become one of only 12 countries to follow through with the UN's recommendation to update their Nationally Determined Contributions, or NDCs, by the end of 2022. These are basically just formally made decarbonization commitments. Vanuatu also plans to continue pushing wealthy countries through public pressure and legal action to financially help emerging economies to pay for climate adaptation and mitigation efforts. This includes pushing the International Court of Justice to give an advisory opinion on climate harm other countries and groups could point to when they're suing corporations or countries. Vanuatu got other island nations to join it in its fight. Truly a kick-ass country. In Europe, Hayward Heaths, England, became Europe's first town to sign on a plant-based treaty initiative aimed to pressure world leaders to move their populations away from an animal product-heavy diet. 
industrial animal agricultural practices, especially relating to cattle and sheep, are huge sources of greenhouse gas emissions due to methane laced burping and farting and associated deforestation. It also drives biodiversity loss and water pollution. So reducing your meat and dairy intake, even if it's not going full-blown veganism, can help reduce your impact. Hayward's Heath might be the first European country to sign on, but it joins 17 other cities worldwide that have signed on too. Berkeley, California is a big location for this initiative. The three main parts of the plant-based treaty are stop the problem from increasing, eliminate the driving forces behind the problem, and actively heal the problem while building resilience and mitigating climate change. If you would like to learn more, there will be a link in the source list below. California Governor Newsom officially proposed extending the Diablo Canyon nuclear plant's life beyond the scheduled 2025 closing date by 5 to 10 years. The draft proposal includes a $1.4 billion forgivable loan to PG&E and directs state agencies to clear the way for the reactor to continue operating. This plant has been fought over for decades and was pretty close to being closed. Anti-nuclear environmentalists see it as unsafe in an earthquake state. Pro-nuclear environmentalists see it as a form of stable clean energy. We have some climate fails. The world's largest fossil fuel exporter, Saudi Aramco, reported record quarterly profits of $48.4 billion or 40 billion pounds. Its previous record was made in the first quarter of 2022. It's been a 90% year-on-year increase since the company went public three years ago. Saudi Aramco also announced it would keep its dividend unchanged at $18.4 billion for the third quarter because it's using its profits to expand to satisfy demand. This is just the latest in a long list of fossil fuel companies reporting record earnings during the Russian and Ukrainian war, some for multiple times in a row now. Meanwhile, a major U.S. liquefied natural gas exporter, Chenier Energy, is allegedly greenwashing itself to justify expanding operations. It started reporting emissions using carbon emissions tags that it puts on its gas to ease buyer concerns about emissions. It supposedly includes emissions up and downstream, so what's the problem? Well, Oil Change International and Greenpeace accused the company of ignoring a lot of methane emissions and promoting a disingenuous clean image of its fossil gas. To be fair, this is partially due to the company using Environmental Protection Agency, or EPA, data, which has been exposed in recent years for undercounting methane emissions. The emissions data is also based on averages, even though the differences in emissions from one shipment to another can vary based on how and where it's made, processed, and shipped. If you want to learn more about Chenier Energy's alleged deceptive emissions tracking practices, check out Desmog's article in the source list below. For reference, Desmog is a media organization that does a great job at chopping down greenwashing and climate disinformation. It has whole databases on the Koch brothers, climate disinformation, air pollution lobbying, and agribusiness. Great stuff. I want to finish today's episode with a sign of a potential shift. Some members of the UK government are starting to question the sustainability of burning wood chips, particularly from the Drax power station. Drax gets its wood chips from North America. Business and Energy Secretary Kuang Tang said burning wood chips is not sustainable and doesn't make financial sense. This is big because the UK currently has a biomass-reliant plan, with biomass and waste currently representing 10% of the country's energy supplies. The industry has received £5.6 billion in subsidies from energy bills over the last decade, and it's true that burning wood chips isn't sustainable. Advocates for this form of biomass say it's regenerative because they can always plant more trees, but young trees take a while to take up as much carbon as old growth trees. Also, we should have learned about how bad burning wood is for air pollution from history. So this is just an important opinion in the UK government, but I think it's a hopeful sign of change. And that was your climate recap for Tuesday, August 16th. If you like the work I do, please follow this podcast, give it a five-star rating, leave a review, and consider checking out the Beckosphere Climate Corner YouTube channel. Remember to talk about the climate crisis every single day and to support your local news organizations. Bye for now.